Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netrootsradio.com Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du Fred Astaire Revoir un latte coeur So far I've had four death threats I've been evicted from my uh, office in uh, the in Colorado uh, I have notice of an eviction um, because the landlord is mad with my uh, voting record uh, on, on this speaker issue um, and everybody in the conference is getting this so, so it's natural uh, family members have been approached and, and threatened Republican Congressman Ken Buck telling NBC's Kristen Welker just how volatile the speaker's race has become. But to make sense of the Republican Party's hostile style of violent governing, all you have to do is look at the aftermath of January 6th. In 2022, instead of condemning those who supported the insurrectionists and its Supreme Leader Donald Trump, the RNC chose to formally censure two Republican lawmakers, Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger, because they chose to expose the truth about the attack on our nation's capital. And the official censure resolution referred to the 1-6 investigation as, quote, persecution of ordinary citizens engaged in legitimate political discourse. So when storming the Capitol to illegally overturn an election is considered, quote, legitimate political discourse by the RNC, what's a death threat among friends? Joining me now is someone who survived the tragic violence of January 6th, former Capitol Police officer and the author of the new book, American Shield, the immigrant sergeant who defended democracy, Sergeant Akalino Ganell. Sergeant, it's an honor to have you on the show. Um, number one, thank you for your service on many levels, not only serving in our armed forces for the United States, but also serving as an officer with the United States Capitol Police. Back in July of 2021, sir, while testifying before the House Select Committee, you described the Capitol on 1-6 as a, quote, medieval battleground. You were injured so badly that day that you required multiple surgeries and your career in law enforcement ended. I wanted to get your thoughts as this speaker's race is currently going on. I wanted to know what you thought about the Republican Party's repeated embrace of violent threats and intimidation tactics, which have now inflamed that speaker's race. Um, good morning. Thank you for having me uh, on your show. Uh, it's continued to be, uh, I continue to be amazed and outstanding, uh, stunning uh, to know that the Republican Party, the party of the rule of law, as they claim to be, uh, they continue to double down on a lot of things that are shown to be contrary to what the model is. Uh, if you look at the speaker race, yeah, it is to have the, the notion of uh, nominating someone who has repeatedly um, go against what uh, the Constitution stands for. Uh, somebody who tried to uh, over, um, to go against it and, and then um, be nominated multiple times uh, for someone who is a material witness to the events of January 6th who have refused 
uh, to to participate uh, on, for the investigation uh, and do and follow up with the subpoena that was issued to him uh, for multiple months already, and 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 that's the the person that they best uh, find to be a qualified someone who had defied the constitution itself is astounding. Sergeant, while you were speaking, we had a graphic up that showed the names of the House Republicans that have put their hats into the ring to be able to become the next speaker. And among them, several election deniers. It's not even just they denied the election results, sir. They actually voted to overturn their election results of 2020. How troublesome is it to you that being an election denier isn't immediately disqualifying to hold one of the top legislative positions in our United States Congress? It's a disservice to all the sacrifices that uh, not only myself uh, did, but my colleagues and, and our forefathers. I mean, you have the constitu- a violation of the Constitution that they continue and repeatedly uh, uh, try to uh, overthrow the, the government. Uh, now they are changing the uh, state election officials to pot- potentially uh, vote against or, or not certify the election result, depending on what results those are. So it, it's, it, it has become like a linear test for them to, in order for them to show fealty to the former president, they they had to say all those things and unless um there's a fear or a uh, danger to themselves like uh, uh congressman uh, buck like he was saying that he was receiving threats we did warn him and everybody else when we testified that had this conversation the way that their uh, the re- their rhetoric, rhetoric and all those things that they are have been doing since the election, since January 6th, um, if it continue, then they will be getting the threats. And it's sad that they only care when their own family, their own safety is at stake. And that's when they want to change. Uh, do I want them, do I commend him for uh, doing that and saying those things? Um, not really, because now it's his family that uh, is getting affected by, but they had the chance to put this guy, uh, the former president, away politically, and they mm-hmm. refused to. So it's, it's um, up on themselves now that, oh, it's my family is being uh, affected, therefore I need to care and say something about it, which is sad. Sergeant, I want to talk about your new book, American Shield. It follows your journey. You immigrated to the United States from the Dominican Republic. And I want people to know, you actually took the oath of service to serve in the United States Army before you actually even took your oath to be a U.S. citizen. You felt so, it felt it was so important to you to be able to serve in that capacity to defend the United States. You served in Iraq, and then you came back and you worked as a U.S. Capitol Police officer. For those people that are gonna go and they're gonna get your book and read your book, what do you want them to take away from that story, which is exclusively yours? Well, and as I speak in my book, uh, the, the idea of me joining the military happened before um, uh, for all the reasons other than uh, education, but 9-11 changed that. And then I became, uh, I, I developed a, a uh, affinity to this nation, uh, not a person. And I had done a lot, a lot of sacrifice both overseas, including as a police officer. Um, so I literally check all the boxes that the GOP says that I, I, a um, foreign individual, a, a immigrant, should be in this country. I had uh, served this, in this country uh, in the military. I, I learned the language. I have been a productive member of our society. I became a police officer. I defended the country both overseas and, and here. Um, and so I, I, don't, I don't understand like sometimes um, when they say, oh, I'm a, a, an actor or anything, something like that, um, that I don't fit the boxes that they created for me to fit. And I had checked each one and every one of those. And yet they don't think that it's worth for them to mention me uh, or parade me. I'm not saying that I should be, 
I'm saying that that's why they say that that the. Uh, I don't expect that from happening either. Uh, had I been saying Antifa, Black Lives Matters, or any other group um, uh, were the one attacking the Capitol on January 6th, I'm sure they'll be calling me every day, but they don't. Uh, only Adam Kinsinger and Liz Cheney's were the only one out of those people that I uh, risked my life for on January 6th uh, had been the one um, from the Republican side, the elected officials that uh, had talked to me, got, had given me the time of the day to, yeah. to actually listen to me and my colleagues. It is Monday, the 23rd of October of 2023. And you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef to cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. Precious, our little Yorkie is the door girl. And she will be seating you directly for our especially special daily special, River City Hash Mondays. Because that's what we do on Mondays after a weekend. We put a hash together. That's what we do. And uh, other than that, how was your weekend? Yes, uh, we have some leftover that we can reconstitute into a gourmet delight for your intellectual sustenance here. On a Monday in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Thanks for stopping by. Uh, well, <laughs> I... I, I don't know. Should I stay on Twitter? I know that people say that the fight is there. But I'm getting a little perturbed by the abject propaganda and, shall I say, brainwashing. There is so much gaslighting on there now. It's, well, hard to keep up. And they call that the gish gallop, where your opponent just lays on all the information and and arguments and expects you to make a point by point rebuttal and while you're wasting time on that they're deluging you with even more bs and expecting you to keep up and so then what happens you give up and you go okay i concede whatever it is that you're trying to argue because it's just too voluminous for me to keep up Okay, I used to think that gatekeepers, gatekeepers were were like a bad thing. <laughs> Boy, that's the folly of youth, isn't it? That belief. Oh, we don't need gatekeepers. Apparently, we do. <laughs> just you know, just to keep the BS at uh, you know bay. You got a billionaire shall I say, fascist, running the show, and he still continues to get government money to run his businesses. And he's fed it as some sort of uh, pulled himself up by his bootstraps. Sure he did. Jesus. First he gets a leg up by being the heir to an apartheid blood emerald fortune. And then he gets government money to finance his wacko endeavors. Jeez. I love that cyber truck. <laughs> yeah. People are flocking to buy that. What an ugly piece of feces. But when you're a billionaire, uh, apartheid, blood emerald fortune guy... You don't care, do you? You can do whatever you want. So this guy bought, and I got to say, for all the faults that Twitter had, it was one of the most effective uh, tools for democratic movements around the world. And we all said, well, most of us, warned that what would happen is and is happening, would happen, and it is. We warned it would happen, and it is happening. Okay, well, that's a complaint that we've all heard here before, and I suppose I shouldn't flog the horse, so to speak. What else is out there? Well, a Jewish leader in uh, Michigan, Detroit area, 
was stabbed to death. Uh, the police are immediately saying it has nothing to do with her being a Jewish leader or a Democratic uh, fundraiser and and uh, mentor. Nah. Immediately, it has nothing to do with any of that. Don't have a suspect. Don't have a motive. But they're assuring us the motive has nothing, nothing to do with her being Jewish and Democratic. Or Democratic. Neither. So that's good. We can. It's just one of those, I don't know, process crimes, I suppose. It was just the process of somebody stabbing someone who's fairly well known in the area. But hey. That makes me feel at ease. At the same time, six-year-olds are stabbed 26 times because of what a guy heard on Fox News and right-wing media, Sinclair, etc. And there are people saying, "Oh, well, his, uh, you know, his like being a, a, you know, a Muslim kid had nothing to do with it." No, really. And I'm also I I don't know will I will I lose people do should should I care that I might lose people because I think that it's untoward to refer to President Joe Biden as genocide Joe. What the f is that all about? Seems like a lot of Bernie Bros out there pushing that meme. And Bernie sisters too. What's that all about? It seems as if one were to mess up and mess around with our election as Putin, China, Iran, et al. have been doing for quite some time. Wouldn't they take a crime of opportunity to make the people so very afraid? 1,400 people were massacred in cold blood. And before we even get to mourn their deaths, we're hearing about genocide. And I'm not talking about genociding the Jews. Seems as if it was a little too coordinated for my taste. This backlash this massacre apologizing and some of it is apologizing but never even mentioning it now I hate war I don't want war it'd be nice to have a ceasefire but hey if we're going to have a ceasefire shouldn't we like maybe release the hostages why are the hostages like forgotten they're the spoils of war for generations of of reprisals, this is our chance. That's excused. Now, I know I'm not Jared Kushner, but I can make a lot of simple solutions to this incident that we are confronted with at this very moment. And one of my simple solutions is you want a ceasefire? You want humanitarian aid? Give up the Hamas terrorists that carried out a massacre on, on October 7th. How about that? How about that? Give them up. Very simple. Ah. <sighs> Am I going to argue that the Palestinians have no right to exist? Of course not. We're talking human rights. But does that trump the fact that 1,400 people were massacred in cold blood and we're just going to let it go? I'm not talking about burning down blocks in Philadelphia like they did against MOVE. And anyway, I mean, that has no comparison because MOVE was, didn't do anything. They were just a threat for being black nationalists. I'm just saying that, uh, you know, there's no excuse for heavy handedness in response to a crime. Some of us remember that firefight 
in, uh, was it Compton? Well, Southern California, Los Angeles area with the SLA. When a lot of people thought that maybe uh, Patty Hearst was in that house. And the cops kept the uh, fire uh, department from putting out the fire for a considerable time. And, you know, I suppose rightfully so, since there was all sorts of ordnance exploding from the fact that the place was like firebond and just burning like crazy. And that the SLA members tried to get down underneath the house, but that wasn't good enough because all the air gets sucked up right where they're laying but regardless, some people thought that that was a justified response because of what the SLA, you know, represented and and did. When I always thought that the cops are there to bring the perp to court, they're not supposed to be judge, jury, and executioner. But in this case... So as wacko as the SLA turned out to be, and as wacko as the BS that they did, I should mention, uh, I I didn't live there at the time, but I did live in a place that was, oh, just across the street and two houses up, three houses up from where I lived in Berkeley in the Elmwood. Yeah, right there at Derby and Benvenue. You people will know that place. Right around the corner from the Julia Morgan Theater. Uh Uh-huh. Anyway. Did the LAPD's response to firebombing a house where they had people that they could have apprehended and figured out where an heiress was being held hostage at? Well, by that time... Patty Hearst was part of the group, according to the cops, and her holding a firearm and, you know, during the bank robbery. You know, they couldn't see through that she was, like, being made to do that, like the hostage videos that we see now. In fact, as I said, a lot of people thought she was in there. I bet, including the cops. Did they care about the hostages? Not that one. (sighs) Okay. So we got wacko people like Netanyahu. And then we got wacko people like Hamas. I don't see anybody like saying Hamas is being, you know, genociding. Which is what they are doing. And do I like the idea of Gaza being firebombed from above? Of course not. Give up the Hamas perps who perpetrated the massacre on October 7th. And we'll go from there. Seems simple to me, but then again, I'm not Jared Kushner, so I'm not able to push through these simple solutions for two bill. Give me two bill and I'll solve it all. All right. What do we have in store for you on the in for the rest of uh, our time here in this salon that we call West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Well, yeah, at the top, uh, multiple House Republicans have reported receiving threats and harassment following their speaker votes. And I got to tell you. You read the syntax, the misspellings, the sentence structure, or lack thereof. And if you happen to be lucky enough to hear an audio of these threats, it sure sounds like John Barron to me. Sure does. (laughs) Yeah, it does. Check it out. Anyway, on the rest of the menu, uh, police in an Atlanta suburb pledged a full investigation after residents reported anti-Semitic flyers plastered throughout the community. The Charlottesville, Virginia City Council suspended virtual public comments after anonymous callers zoomed into a council meeting and made racist remarks. And Michigan State has suspended an employee involved in allowing Adolf Hitler's image 
to be shown on video boards for a quiz contest before playing arch rival Michigan over the weekend. What the heck? After the break, we move to the chef's table where envoys of the European Union and the United States urged Kosovo and Serbia to resume their dialogue before bitter tensions between the two sides results in more violence. That seems to be going around, doesn't it? And the Greek economy won a new vote of confidence with a credit rating upgrade and hopes for an investment boost. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com to the right of the page is the chat room link, and the chat room is monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. Across the page to the left from that chat room link that just happens to be near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is the link to our Patreon page. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, it really does help us pay our bills and the other costs that accrue running this powerhouse of resistance. So thank you for allowing us to fulfill our civic duty as the founders originally intended so many, many years ago. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, Mastodon, Spoutable, Blue Sky, etc., do so at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of those. Thank you, Tom. Follow me on Twitter, Mastodon, Spoutable, Blue Sky, Instagram, Tumblr, Facebook, (laughs) at Justice Putnam, or just simply Justice Putnam, depending, of course. And I post the show notes and links diary on Daily Co's 10 minutes before showtime. And you can find those diaries by going to my social media feeds where the links are right there. And therefore, you can read the actual reportage that has inspired each and every of our days here during the week at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. You can follow the show on Twitter at Cookbook West and pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes. Really, wherever podcasts can be found, you just can't find them on Stitcher. Nope. Not anymore. Okay, let us get into this first offering here in the Bistro Cafe. It is very short, and it is brought to us by, well, the weekend news desk at the Associated Press. Police in an Atlanta suburb are urging tolerance after multiple residents reported finding flyers with anti-Semitic and hateful messages. Brookhaven police said in a news release on Facebook that the reports came in on Sunday yesterday. They pledged a full investigation and said hate speech will not be tolerated in the city. They also encourage residents to embrace the city's diversity. Well, in this reporter's opinion, it just might have been the city's diversity that perpetuated the attack. I hope they find these perps.
more staff at the weekend news desk of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays. The Charlottesville City Council has suspended virtual public comments during public meetings after anonymous callers zoomed into a council meeting and made racist remarks. The Daily Progress reports that the decision came after an October 2nd council meeting was interrupted repeatedly by people who turned their cameras off, used fake names, and flooded the public comment period with racist slurs and praise for Adolf Hitler. We struggled for a while in trying to figure out what we could constitutionally do and concluded there was not really a good answer, Mayor Lloyd Snook told the newspaper last week. Do we listen to everybody as they're ranting, knowing that if they were there in person, they probably wouldn't do it, but feel free to do it anonymously online? Under the new policy... The public will still be able to attend meetings virtually, but anyone who wishes to speak will have to do so in person. In August of 2017, hundreds of white nationalists descended on Charlottesville, ostensibly to protest city plans to remove a statue of Confederate general and traitor to the United States, I might add, Robert E. Lee. James Alex Fields Jr. of Momie, Ohio, rammed his car into a crowd of people who were protesting against the white nationalists, injuring dozens and killing Heather Heyer, a 32-year-old paralegal and civil rights activist. Fields is now serving life in prison for murder, hate crimes, and other charges. During the meeting, the people in attendance could be heard gasping after some of the remarks and several demanded that the speakers be cut off. Council members questioned whether the virtual public comments were protected by the First Amendment as the first speaker to make racist remarks claimed. Snook eventually looked to city attorney Jacob Stroman for guidance, and Stroman said the council could cut off the speaker. The Daily Progress reported that the remarks at the meeting seemed spurred at least in part by the city's decision to lift the curfew at a park after police were accused of mistreating the homeless population there. The story had been circulating in national right-wing media ahead of the meeting. Police Chief Michael Cochis called the allegations unfounded and said the city plans to reinstate the curfew to coincide with the availability of more beds for the unhoused. desk of the Associated Press brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Michigan State Athletic Director Alan Holler said he has suspended an employee involved in allowing Adolf Hitler's image to be shown on video boards before playing number two Michigan. The employee, who was not named, will be paid pending an investigation that will help to determine potential action in the future. Holler said no one in the department viewed the entire video, exposing a failure in its process. Anti-Semitism must be denounced, Holler said in a statement Sunday night. The image displayed prior to Saturday night's game is not representative of who we are and the culture we embody. Nevertheless, we must own our failures and accept responsibility. 
the creator and producer of the Quiz Channel on YouTube, which includes Hitler's image as part of a quiz, said the school did not ask for permission to use the YouTube video uh, or his content or pay him for it and defended his decision to include the question on his platform. It is an absolutely normal trivia question, showing it in an inappropriate setting, Floris Van Pallant wrote on his YouTube page, ignoring the dark facets of history is by no means the answer. On the contrary. Now, the channel is publicly available and free for users. While the Rover Wolverines were finishing off a 49-0 win over the Spartans on Saturday night, Michigan State spokesman Matt Larson apologized that the inappropriate content was displayed more than an hour before kickoff. Michigan State streamed the quiz channel, which had 40 questions in his latest video, including asking where Hitler was born with his image before showing Austria as the answer. The previous question asked in Star Trek, what color was Spock's blood before Green was shown as the answer. Holler said he will reach out to Jewish community groups in the East Lansing area and on campus to tell them personally how the department failed and provide a chance to give feedback. I understand our response might be met with skepticism, Holler said. That skepticism is warranted, and we will do all that is necessary to earn back your trust. Let us now go to our break, and when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world, and we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. This week, one swift review. While the rock scene has its deadheads and parrotheads, the pop scene's artist-specific fan bases have been more ephemeral, perhaps due to the age of those fans, until today's Swifties, the devotees of pop star Taylor Swift, who aren't all 12. More is going on here. Despite their success, the Backstreet Boys or Britney Spears never turned a movie of one of their shows into a hundred million bucks in a week or a tour into four billion and counting. Yours is the name of that tour and the impressive 168-minute concert film, and it is primarily for Swifties. As the title implies, the show focuses on the eras of Swift's career as distinguished by her albums. With the exception of those demarcations noted on screen, there are no captions or other text, nor any interview or background footage, much like Muse's 2019 simulation theory. The production is dazzling, and for the price of a nosebleed seat in some stadium, you are right there, and then some, gliding and swooping with the floor and drone cameras. As to what else is going on here, we're not in the habit of referring to other reviews, but there's a negative one in a right-wing mag called the National Review that in its reciprocal, and in far less time than we have here, is key to understanding what's cool and important about the Swifties. The perspective of that reviewer is that of an old codger threatening kids in his yard, sort of a Harold Bloom without the intellect, and who sees civilizational threat behind every trend, especially if youthful and inquisitive. Just turning your back on this crap is reason enough to check out Eras, but in addition, you'll enjoy a damn fine pop show. This has been Take Two Movie Review. I'm Mike Friend. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. Parenting can seem a thankless gig. First, you and your partner track down a dead body. Next, the two of you work together to bury it. And it's often many times the size of your own body. 
If it starts to rot or you start to snack on this body, you'll have to cover the stench of decomposition with your own anal secretions so that other hungry, desperate, overworked parents don't come looking for your lunch. And this all before your kids are even born. That is, if you're a sylphid beetle. You're listening to Scientific American's Science Quickly. I'm Emily Schwing. So they're commonly called burying beetles. And in England, they're called sexton beetles. Sextons were people who buried the dead. And that's what these beetles do. Derek Sykes is the curator of insects and a professor of entomology at the University of Alaska Fairbanks Museum of the North. A study he and a colleague published in the Journal of Zoology explores the parental behavior of these undertaking beetles. Yeah, so they bury dead uh, vertebrates like a dead bird or mouse, and they'll work together as a male-female team to get it down underground, and they try to find it when it's really fresh, sometimes within hours of death, uh, before there's any noticeable smell to, to humans. In his lab, Sykes opens a cabinet door and slides out a drawer filled with black and orange armored beetles. This is a world collection. Uh, so I've traveled all around the world and collected these in various parts of Asia. Um, they're primarily found in the northern hemisphere. Um, and when they do occur in the southern hemisphere, it's usually on mountaintops, which gives us a concern for them for climate change because they're very cold adapted. Mountaintops in the tropics are becoming warmer and warmer. They're going to have to move up slope, and they may eventually lose habitat entirely. Wow, now, some of them are very big. Though that big one that you're pointing at is commonly called the American burying beetle. And there is a few giant species in this this genus. This big one is, is about is the one size of, of my thumb. World All black with plates it's of armor, its exoskeleton, laid out across its back. It, 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 other burying beetles have orange, jagged stripes on their backs. Some are about the size of a sunflower seed or even smaller. Sylphid beetles belong to the subfamily Nicrophorinae. And parenting beetles don't just simply bury small dead creatures and leave. Lurking in the shadows of the forest floor where these bugs roam, there's a lot of competition. Other hungry beetles and lots of vertebrate scavengers all looking to feast on the same things sylphids love to eat. But if more than one male or female find it, they'll fight with each other. And so uh, there'll be these beetle battles, right? And it's the largest beetles, invariably, that win these fights and uh, drive off their competitors until you have the largest male and the largest female who work together to dig underneath the carcass and get it down into a crypt. And they try to do this as fast as possible because... The clock is ticking. There's there's blowflies, there's vertebrate scavengers, there's all kinds of things that want to eat a small dead carcass. So they try to monopolize it and try to get it entirely for themselves. The sylphid so fiercely protects its food source because the eggs it lays will also feed on whatever's buried in this seeming crypt. Sykes says the reproductive output of this particular kind of beetle is low compared to other insects which is all the more reason they try to keep their food hidden. Yeah, parental care in beetles is pretty rare. Alongside behavioral ecologist Steve Trumbo at the University of Connecticut, Sykes discovered that the better the beetles prove to be as parents, the better they are at concealing their crypt-turned pantry from other creatures who might be feeling peckish. Think about it. When a, when a bird or mouse dies um, and it begins to rot... Uh, the, the more smelly it becomes, the, the more things can find it quickly. That smell? To be honest, it's coming from microbe farts, what the researchers call volatiles, that result from the decomposition process. But sylphids don't want any other competition to know their food is rotting. What we've discovered is that the excretions uh, and secretions of these beetles uh, help conceal the scent from their competitors. Um, and close relatives that aren't in this group, when they manipulate a carcass, um, and those, when we put those out in the field, they are, they are more easily found by bearing beetles than control carcasses that haven't been manipulated. Mm -hmm. um, so 
So this is a clear example that the beetles have, are doing something special to conceal the smell of the carcass. There are only about 70 species of burying beetles in the world. Sykes says that's a low number within the insect kingdom, and he believes that might be directly related to the parental care they offer their young. So in most insects, there's very little parental care. Female, like a mosquito, it's usually limited to just choice of where they're going to put the eggs. They're going to put the eggs in a place that should give them a good chance of survival, um, their preferred habitat, you know. Um, but with these beetles and some other insects that show parental care, they're, the adults are spending a lot of time with their offspring as they're developing um, and doing interesting things like sharing their microbiome. And though we're only now just discovering the lengths to which sylphid parents go for their brood, the beetles, it appears, learned their morbid tricks while avoiding the footfalls of ancient creatures like the Tyrannosaurus rex. We estimate it was in Asia in the um, probably Cretaceous when this first evolved. After 100 million years or so of practice, burying beetle parents have the job down cold, but also stench-free and ready for eating. Yummy. Science Quickly is produced by Jeffrey Delvisio, Tulika Bose, and Kelso Harper. Our music was composed by Dominic Smith. Like and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And for more science news, please go to scientificamerican.com. For Science Quickly, I'm Emily Schwing. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin. And since you're listening to netrootsradio.com, Show your progressive side and go to the donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power Netroots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our donate button at the bottom of netrootsradio.com. Thank you for keeping progressive radio at full power. You're listening to the American Democracy Minute, keeping your government by and for the people. A Louisiana racial gerrymandering case we've been following will be allowed to go forward, but just not as quickly due to a U.S. Supreme Court no-action decision on October 19th. It could still mean fairer maps before the 2024 election. The Louisiana case is a similar racial gerrymandering case to the Alabama Milligan case, which required two majority-minority congressional districts. Louisiana's population is 30% African American, more than Alabama's, yet has only one majority-minority congressional district out of six. The lower court judge in the case ordered new maps with two majority black districts, citing an inability of the legislature to do so before 2024. Just before a hearing in early October, the state of Louisiana asked for an emergency stay, which the Fifth Circuit Federal Court of Appeals surprisingly granted. Democracy groups appealed. Last Thursday, the U.S. Supreme Court refused to intervene, letting the emergency stay stand and cases in the lower and appeals courts to proceed. A legal defense fund attorney was still optimistic that fair maps could be redrawn before the 2024 election, according to reporting by the Louisiana Illuminator. Lower court hearings on the maps are expected to resume February 5, 2024. In the meantime, a federal appeals court hears Louisiana's appeal to give its legislature more time to draw its own maps. We have more on this complicated case at AmericanDemocracyMinute.org. I'm Brian Beal. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1989. At 1.05 in the afternoon, a massive explosion rocked the town of Pasadena, Texas, near Houston. The explosion was so large, it registered a 3.5 on the Richter scale. The disaster took place at the Phillips Petroleum Company's Houston Chemical Complex. The Pasadena facility produces plastics. The fire started when highly flammable gas was released from an improperly connected valve. 
23 workers were killed. More than 300 more were injured. The Houston Chronicle described the devastating impact of the explosion, writing, Entire buildings vanished as a huge black smoke plume billowed skyward in an almost apocalyptic vision. Homes as far as eight miles away were damaged. After the explosion, the company rebuilt its facilities. A year after the disaster, Tom Gentry, president of the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers Local 4-227, thought the company could do more to improve workplace safety. He told the Chronicle reporter, the company still uses outside contractors with less safety training, and workers become tired because of bare-bones staffing. At the time of the explosion, there were 905 company workers, and an additional 600 contracted employees who worked at the facilities. OSHA found multiple safety violations. The company eventually came to an agreement with OSHA and paid a $4 million fine. In 1999, another explosion killed two workers at the Pasadena facility. The next year, yet another explosion killed one worker and injured 71. The company continued to hire contracted employees. After the third explosion in 11 years, Joe Campbell, secretary treasurer of the paper Allied Industrial Chemical and Energy Workers International said, the company continued to hire contractors who have little or no experience working in a volatile workplace. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. River City Hash Mondays. We always begin, whether from around the world, along the banks of the Rogue River and the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon, on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently brr, 46 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting highs only in the mid-60s, Cloudy skies early. Uh, we are under foggy conditions, by the way, currently. And then partly cloudy this afternoon. We are expecting once again, as we did late last week and through the weekend. We had quite a bit of rain, by the way, through the weekend. We're expecting mist and reduced visibility at times. And winds will be light and variable. Partly to mostly cloudy tomorrow or tonight with lows in the low 40s, winds light and variable. Mostly cloudy tomorrow with a slight chance of rain and rain showers with highs in the low 60s. Winds will be light and variable and then looks like we might have a good drop of rain Wednesday and Thursday. We'll see how that goes. Barometric pressure is holding steady at 30.04 inches. Visibility is at three quarters of a mile. And relative humidity is at 100%. Weather from around the world is brought to us from a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. But for some reason, the weather underground dropped all of my presets for the cities and towns from around the world that we draw our info from. So it will be quite abbreviated. I don't know what's going on. I tried to add my cities and they wouldn't let me add them. So they must be doing some sort of uh, maintenance over there at the weather underground. But right now... We have London is uh, 58 and mostly cloudy. Paris is 54 and cloudy. And it looks like Rome is 75 and, and sunny, though they do have a potential disruption because of rain. Kabul is, let's see if I can bring that up very quickly. It is 53 degrees and, uh, excuse me, I'm, everything's going so slow. Looks like it is 53 degrees and clear skies. Okay, so where are we now? Kiev, we'll go to Kiev, is 58 and cloudy. Hong Kong we weren't able to bring up, unfortunately, and Neither were we able to bring up Tokyo. 
Looks like uh, looks like Sydney, New South Wales is sixty three, <laughs> and clear skies. Oh, sixty three and clear skies. Isn't that nice? Wouldn't let me get to San Francisco either. What? Let's see if I can get San Francisco drawn up here quickly. Seventy two degrees. And uh, they are partly cloudy skies with winds at 10 to 20 miles per hour. So usually that's a small craft advisory on the bay. Chicago, Illinois. They wouldn't let me bring Chicago, Illinois up either. So let's see. I have to bring it up individually. It is 52 degrees with suns with sun and clouds mixed. Winds out of the south-southeast at 10 to 20 miles per hour. And wouldn't let me bring up New York either, but let's see what Manhattan looks like. Manhattan is 54 degrees and sunny. And that is weather from around the world. Brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. And Lazar Samini of the Associated Press brings us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays. The envoys of the European Union and the United States urged Kosovo and Serbia to resume their dialogue on normalizing relations before the bitter tensions between the two sides results in more violence. Envoy uh, Mer. Miroslav uh, Lejak and U.S. Special Representative to the Western Balkans, Gabriel Escobar, met with Prime Minister Alban Kurti in Kosovo's capital, Pristina. They later traveled to Serbia for a meeting with President Vucic in Belgrade. The visitors were accompanied by top Diplomats from Germany, France, and Italy reflecting Western concerns over the crisis in the volatile Balkan region. It was the first such engagement since about 30 Serb gunmen crossed into northern Kosovo on September 24th, killing a police officer and setting up barricades before launching an hours-long gun battle with Kosovo police. Three gunmen were killed. Lejak said that during their meeting with Kurdi, the foreign official stressed that the terrorist attack against Kosovo police by armed individuals, that constitutes a clear and unprecedented escalation. He added that the attack also very clearly underlined that both de-escalation and normalization are now more urgent than ever. Serbia and its former province, Kosovo, have been at odds for decades. Their 1998-1999 war left more than two or ten hundred, I'm sorry, ten thousand dead. Their uh, war lasted from 88 to 99, not a uh, one year. I don't know where they came up with that. Kosovo uh, unilaterally declared independence in 2008, but Belgrade has refused to recognize the move. Both Kosovo and Serbia want to join the EU, which has told them that they first need to sort out their differences. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers C'est 
Associated Press staff at the Weekend World Desk brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Greece won new certification of its financial health as Standard & Poor's became the first of the three major international rating agencies to upgrade the formerly struggling country's credit rating to investment grade. The one-notch upgrade from BB plus to BBB minus is expected to significantly boost market confidence in the Greek economy, attracting investment and lowering borrowing costs. The center-right government hailed it as a major success. It came more than a decade after Greece's bonds were relegated to sub-investment or junk grade amid the financial crisis that pushed the country to the brink of financial collapse and forced three massive international bailouts. To secure the rescue loans, successive Greek governments undertook to impose painful spending cuts and tax hikes, while broadly reforming the economy and balancing the state budget. Standard & Poor said Greece's outlook was stable, while a further reduction in the country's debt as a percentage of annual output could prompt a new future upgrade. Securing investment grade was a key target for Prime Minister Mitsotakis, who won a second term in office in a landslide election victory in June. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Ton mange à d'un d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair Ton bras les yeux ouverts Ton mange à d'un d'hiver
Comment je te vivais 